Thank you very much. It's a, um, it's a great honor and privilege, of course, to be a Gresham professor and to, to give lectures to people like yourselves. It's always a great treat for me. Um, and, um, but it's been a bit of a challenge uh, to put this together, and I hope that I'm going to be sharing with you some ideas about how psychology relates to criminology. And actually, this really is an enormous topic, and I'm conscious that there may be well be people in the room who know a great deal about criminology and indeed psychology and will be able to attest just how complicated the relationship is. Because the field of psychology really includes an enormous number of different disciplines. It really is one of the most, um, sort of, uh, most sort of sophisticated of disciplines in the sense of a number of different discourses are involved. So um, I was very, in, when I was putting this lecture together, I read a very interesting paper from the 1960s by, uh, uh, by a criminologist called, called Clifford Jeffrey, who talked about how criminology really involves perspectives from sociology, crime, psychiatry, anthropology, biology, as well, of course, as the discourses of law and jurisprudence. And there perhaps is an important distinction here between understanding what makes somebody behave in the way that they do, and understanding what makes that behavior criminal. And that second question of what makes a behavior criminal, I'm not really going to engage with, because, as I'm sure you will appreciate, it is really a question that involves a reflection on history and politics and law, and the history of law par excellence, because it, will, it is, in a sense, the history, the history and the discussion of how we come to call something deviant. And I'm not really able to deal with that uh, at, at all. What I really want to do is to look at what, how psychology approaches, how people come to make choices, and how they come to make choices that other people regard as deviant, and what people who make those choices think about that. You see, this quest, these questions here, posed here on this slide, were first posed in a way by Emil Durkheim, who I'm sure, again, some of you will know, 19th century sociologist, who posed this very interesting question, do you commit crimes because you are a criminal? Or do you become a criminal because you commit a crime? And you can see that both those, both, both those situations are quite significantly different. This question, as I say, of who, what is a crime and who gets to decide, we sadly probably can't cover in any way today. But a, a key question that I'm going to be pushing around today quite a lot, because it's something that comes up in the psychology of crime, is the idea that there are a group of people out there who are categorically different from the rest of us, and these are the people called criminals. And I'm going to be talking a lot about that theory, the sort of theory of categorical deviance. And, and what was called, and what's been called in the study of criminology, the positivist school of criminology. That is to say, what makes a person take a positive criminal action. So, just as a bit of background for those of you who don't know this field at all, it is an intriguing question, of course, what we call a law. And the law exists, some people would argue that the law exists really to regulate relationships both within, group, within groups of individuals and between groups of people. That the law is a, is a codification of a social relationship. And it's about how we regulate relationships between each other, given that we have to live each other, with each other in groups. The law is a way of regulating our relationships within those groups. And so laws are very powerful ways of binding us together. And again, we can see here how the study of law is closely gives rise to the, to the study, the sociology of groups and rules generally. How, do, how does rules and agreements bind people together? Because breaches of, of rules tend to lead to expulsion from a group. When you join a group, you agree to abide by its rules. And so breaching its rules tends to lead to some sort of expulsion. And anything that causes harm to the group is usually understood as a type of offence. Um, and actually, it's quite interestingly, back in medieval times, it didn't really matter why you did things. If you broke the rules, you'd be punished and expelled. And actually, even objects could be tried and convicted. Um, animals, even logs of wood. If a log of wood fell, if a branch of, of a tree fell and hit somebody, 
the branch of the tree could be tried and convicted for the offence because an offence had taken place and somebody had been injured, so there had to be a trial. What's interesting about medieval times, indeed classical times, is the attention to due process. There has always been an attention to the due process of how we, how we find an offender, an accused offender, guilty. And again, I, I can't go into that um, in any detail, but of course it's a fascinating question in its own right. Um, of course, in the early days, the idea of the mind of the offender was seen as someone who was sinful, that there was a complete equation of, a, of the breaking of a law and, moral, and a moral wrong, so that people who broke the rules were clearly bad people. And that, of course, provided an explanation for why they broke the rules, so it was a completely circular argument. Why did this person break the rules? Because they're a bad person. How do I know they're a bad person? Because they broke the rules. And again, that is an easy way of developing a type of categorical account of those are the bad people over there and we're the good people over here. And that makes people in groups feel safer. So you can see how a psychology of categorical de deviance becomes a very important focus um, very early on in the study of, of, of criminology. Identifying, marking, and indeed excluding bad people. It's very important. So these are some uh, nice early pictures. Um, Bridgman Education very kindly let, um, give me permission to use some of these images. This is somebody um, having a trial, trying to get the confession. Um, and then this is one, of course, from the, again, from the early 20th century, trying to get the truth out of people and the whole history of lie detection. And again, you can see here, can criminals beat the lie detectors? Assumes that there's a group of people out there called criminals. And you can see... Of course, this is a 1950s uh, picture, and again, a tremendous focus on sort of um, various types of measuring device. And we'll come back to talk a little bit about this emphasis on measurement. And this picture, again, is a 19th century uh, picture of a court process. And I think, it, and I put it in because I thought it nicely sums up sort of general attitudes to offenders. So that the people who are running the court process are completely in the right and the person who's in trouble has to bow a bit and is, and is looked on with contempt, is very shameful, is, you know, has to look humble, has to be begging for a type of mercy, very severe, glowering. This type of process is very characteristic of how, certainly in, in, in Western cultures, we, we tend to think about crime. And so understanding the mind of the person who's committed the criminal offence is already often to take up a position of understanding people who are thought of as being shameful um, or difficult or not very, not very nice. So these are the, this is where we start with criminology and looking at why people break the law is we start with just a classical account, which is the way you define a criminal is in terms of the law. If you break the law, that makes you a criminal. That's the sole definition. And then there's a sociological account, which really, this is something, again, that develops really in the early 20th century and gathers a lot of momentum in the 50s and 60s, and is still a very strong school in, in criminology, which is a sociological account. And I'm guessing many people here will be familiar with this, that people, people break the rules because of the culture and the society in which they find themselves, that whole cultures and groups of people can be seen as be, being identified as deviant, and then once people are identified as deviant, they then, as it were, act into that label. And of course, the sociological account also tells us something about values across time. So for example, and if you needed any convincing that the moral and the, and the legal are two separate things, the apartheid laws um, in South Africa made it both illegal and immoral to be racially tolerant which, of course, is something that makes very little sense now. But at that time, it was not only illegal to be racially tolerant, but also was evidence of your, your antisocial deviance. And similarly, of course, in relation to same-sex relationships, that for hundreds of years, same-sex relationships were seen as being both evidence of sin, but also evidence of illegality were, were illegal. And it, you know, and it really wasn't until the late 20th century, that, that that substantially changed. And that idea about making something, something that's unusual or different, you make it either sinful or illegal, 
that's an ongoing discussion, I think, always in societies about how we make something, how we, we give something a negative valence because it's different. And again, I don't have time to go into that whole process in any detail. But it is, it's actually a very live issue too in relation to mental illness because some of the same concerns about what's deviance um, comes up in relation to mental illness. But this positivist individual take really excludes the social altogether and says, let's just look at the individual. Let's look at there's something in the offender that must make them want to break the law or need to break the law, that it's something in them. So it's an individual uh, account. So in the 19th century, we start, uh, the psychology of crime starts with the idea of criminals are innately degenerate. And the way that we can find that out is we can measure things about them that will tell us, that will show just how different they are from the rest of us. Um, so some of the early studies were about skull size. So um, you know, measuring, people, measuring the skulls of people who've been convicted of offences. Um, that gave rise to looking at brain volumes, which again you can extrapolate from measuring skulls. Body shape, there was quite an interest in body shape in the late 19th century, various types of body shape that made you more likely to commit crimes. And what's interesting about this is that this is where we first find also accounts of genes and of the influence of genes on genetic behaviour. And I will, if I have time, come back to talk about that because the idea that genes might influence criminal behaviour is still a very live, uh, live debate, although the evidence for it is pretty thin. But I'll come back and say a bit more about that later. Uh, and here's a picture of Professor Lombroso, who, say, was really started the whole sort of, uh, the whole study of the sort of criminal skulls and brains. Here's one of his, uh, an illustration from one of his books. And uh, you can't read this very small print, but top left is the skull of Tavecchio, who's a thief, and top right is the skull of Arnioni, who's a brigand. Um, and then the, 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 um, the middle on the left is uh, Signore Gatti, who's a fire setter. So you can see, I'm not quite sure I can see any great difference between these skulls, but, um, but, uh, Professor, but Professor Lombroso thought that he could. Um, and um, and he, was all, he also had a French counterpart who took lots of pictures, uh, Alphonse Bertillon. Um, so then there was a move later after that these, at these sort of external markers of criminality to look much more, of course, in the internal world, the beginning of the, the psychology of the internal landscape, uh, which um, arguably, if not starts with William James, at least is, is explicated in enormous rich detail by William James in the USA um, and to a slightly lesser extent Sigmund Freud uh, in, in Europe. And very much a medical model of mind. Certainly the Freudian account of the mind is very much a medical model, which makes sense. Freud was a physician, he was a neurologist, and his model of the mind, of his model, was uh, that there's the deviant behaviour, the rule-breaking behaviour, is a symptom of some underlying defect or dysfunction. And what the job of the psychologist is, is to try and find that underlying defect or dysfunction, and that will explain... Uh, the rule breaking. So, for example, uh, Freud himself suggested that many criminals were criminals from uh, an unconscious sense of guilt, um, from unresolved um, Oedipal uh, desires. Um, Freud actually was not terribly interested in criminals, and apart from writing this one paper, um, he, he actually said that psychoanalysis should keep right out of the courtroom. Um, and that's in, and it's interesting, and we'll come back to that later if we have time, because that because psychoanalytic theory hasn't come out of the courtroom and has remained quite active. Uh, John Bowlby um, was a uh, psychologist and psychotherapist, again a physician, trained as a paediatrician as well as a child psychiatrist. Um, a lot of studies around the, the war time, and he did one of the first studies of juvenile thieves, um, to first studies of, crim of criminals, and he looked, he compared a group of 44 uh, juvenile thieves with 44 non-thieving boys, and he thought that the juvenile boys had suffered maternal deprivation. Um, and so it was an early study combining environmental experience with early individual psychology. Um, and what he, uh, Bobby argued uh, was um, that lack of care led the boys to feel deprived, and their stealing was an unconscious way to 
to restore res a response to the sense of loss. And whatever you think about the meaning of that, the fact that poverty, of course, plays a big part um, in theft you know, seems hard to deny. Um, again, we know 60% of recorded crime involves some type of property theft, um, and a significant proportion of those people who commit acts of, of theft uh, are, are, are poor. The Nuremberg trials, I think, did a really, again, brought a lot of impetus and interest in the individual minds of offenders. Because, of course, the Nuremberg defendants almost all argued that they were doing what was politically and legally required of them. That they were, not only that they were obeying orders, but that they, were, they had a political mandate to do what they did. That there was a political context, and so from their perspective, they were not criminals, that they were doing the right thing. And that, that, of course, was their view when they were carrying out um, their genocidal acts. Um, and that, that was indeed their, their view. But, of course, that argument wasn't going to pass any muster at the Nuremberg trials. Um, from a socio-political point of view, it would be not be a good idea to have um, countries and political systems to be held to account. So the whole discourse in the Nuremberg trials moved to the individual psychology um, of the perpetrators of the Holocaust. And that gave an enormous... Uh, sort of impetus to the study, to the psychology of crime. <coughs> the other thing that happened through the, <coughs> through the Second World War was, uh, uh, again, a lot of interest in individual deviance because, the, because of the, the emphasis on conservative values and norms during the war. Um, the conservative norms and values were very much part of the post-war response uh, to... And so the idea that explanations for human cruelty and deviance needs to be located in these very dangerous individuals and we need to be able to identify them. But also not only could we identify them, we could hold them responsible. Um, they would be, if we, could, if we could identify what it was that made them do the various things that they were doing, then we could hold them, they would be culpable. But again, this is very much a study, an approach, which holds, sees, people, sees people who break the law as very much other to the norm. This is Hervey Cleckley, who wrote a book called The Mask of Sanity in 1941. And although he is not often talked about as the father of criminal psychology, I think that's really, it's really something that he deserves. Because he wrote um, an extraordinary book, which you can still obtain. Um, sometimes you can find it free online or you can buy it. But it is a study of a group of people who broke the rules <clears throat> and didn't seem to care at all about breaking the rules. <clears throat> These are people that Herbie Cleckley called psychopaths. And what Cleckley meant by psychopaths was a group of people who didn't seem at all distressed or worried by the breaking of the rules. They were not ashamed. They would lie without compunction. They were often charming. They were often pleasant. They drove other people absolutely mad. But they themselves seemed completely unconcerned and it was as if they had an emotional shallowness, an emotional disconnection from other people. And although you know, a few of them got into trouble with the, with the law for violence, the majority of them did not get into trouble for violence, but what they did was to steal and tell lies and deceive people and seem utterly disconnected from any type of, of, of social engagement. And this was later described by um, some subsequent researchers in 1950 as... They know the words, but not the music of human engagement. And that is a beautiful uh, description. That actually comes from a study of, 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 of the soldiers. Um, so it's not actually Cleckley's quote, but it is a beautiful summary of what Cleckley was trying to describe. And in his, in, in his book, he describes lots of case histories in which he tries to get at what's going on uh, with these people. And a substantial group of them broke the law. Um, they were, but they were profoundly antisocial in a much more general sense. And what happened later was that, this, that his ideas were taken up by a man called Robert Hare, um, who I think many other people would think of as probably is the father of criminal psychology, but who applied Cleckley's ideas to violent offenders. And he took Cleckley's signifiers of psychopathy and he applied them to violent offenders. And he found that there is a subgroup of people who are very like this, who just don't care about anything, who are often very charming and very pleasant, 
but profoundly, profoundly antisocial. And if you combine that psychological stance with an aptitude for violence risk and a willingness to break the criminal law, you have someone who's pretty risky. And that's where we get the idea, the current concept of criminal psychopathy, from a mixture of Herbie, of Herbie Cleckley's ideas and Robert Hare's ideas. In this country in the 1960s, um, very interesting work done by um, Sybil and Hans Eysenck about personality traits. They really apply themselves to the idea of a criminal personality um, and they described four major dimensions to personality, sensation seeking, sort of, sort of emotionality, but negative emotionality, being sort of sad, moody, irritable, sort of the negative, painful emotions which they call neuroticism, which is a term we don't use anymore, but negative emotionality we do talk about quite a lot in, criminolo in psychology, criminology. Conscientiousness, open to experience. Psychoticism, this was people who, this is Isink's idea of people who were mentally ill but also very antisocial. Um, and that's really not been replicated in subsequent studies. But a number of studies found, a number of Isink studies found that looking at criminals, that they were indeed high on sensation-seeking and high on these levels of negative emotion. So the Isink School of Personality Study was very influential in Britain for, uh, for many, many years, for a couple of decades, and also gave rise to some other more general work on personality, which has also been influential. The, the Isink's, one of the Isink's early papers on the criminal personality pointed out the personality... Is not, just in, is not just psychological. It's also it's an integration of physiology and gene, genetic influences and environments. And they were one of the, they were one of the first people, uh, Sybil and Hans, I think, to talk about personality in a much more nuanced type of way, bringing in ideas from physiology and genetics. And they anticipated, actually, the current epigenetic studies that I was mentioning earlier on, which is this very... Interesting, what the current research suggests that we may have genetic variations, all of us are likely to have genetic variations, which respond differently to different environments. So some genetic variations may be a risk factor for later behaviours if you're exposed to a certain type of environmental stressor. So, for example, you can take a group of children with a particular version of the monoamine oxidase gene and if you expose those children to an environmental stressor like being physically abused as children, that combination of the genetic risk plus the environmental stressor makes those children more likely to be rule breakers in their teens. And that's been replicated in several studies, also replicated in animal studies, interestingly. And that's what we mean by epigenetics. The environment alters gene expression and the combination of the risky gene expression and the risky environment increases the risk of the, of the behaviour you're concerned about. But the ISINCs anticipated the epigenetic argument um, and study um, by about 50 years. The other group of people um, were uh, across the pond in the, in the United States um, were Samuel Jokerson and his colleague uh, Samuel Usamanov in the 1970s. Now, they came from a very different perspective. The Isinks came from experimental psychology, but Jokerson and Samanoff were therapists. And they were working um, in a hospital, a secure psychiatric hospital um, in, uh, in Connecticut. Um, and they looked at the personalities of the men um, who'd all committed criminal offences, many of whom were thought to be mentally ill. And they started carrying out interviews with them. They came from a psychoanalytic background, um, but what they found was they couldn't really convince themselves that these men had any sort of unconscious conflicts that needed sorting out. But what they did think was that they had a lot of conscious cognitions that made offending more likely, that they seemed to have distorted cognitions. So it's not my fault. You know, they had it coming. You know, it doesn't really matter what I do. Um, you know, I, I was under pressure. Sort of those sorts of, they had sort of distorted cognitions that made it more likely that they would offend. And so their treatment package changed from being you know, daily psychoanalysis to being much more here and now discussions of, of distorted thinking styles. And they really gave rise to the cognitive therapy programs for offenders, which are still available now um, in prisons. Um, and the Jokerson family 
um, very kindly endowed um, a professorship at Yale, and I had the pleasure of being a Jokerson Fellow a couple of years ago. This is what the criminal personality looks like um, from the Jokerson and Samanoff point of view, restless, dissatisfied, irritable. They rec considered requests from their teachers and parents as impositions. They set themselves apart. They want to live a life of excitement at any cost. You see, that's like Isink's sensation-seeking. Angry, lacking empathy. Again, that's a, the negative emotionality. Feel under no obligation to anyone or anything except their own interests. That's hinting at Cleckley's lack of connection. Poor at responsible decision-making. Pre-making assumptions and just not being able to change your decision-making. Not being flexible. And again, that's something that Cleckley talked about. So this is a picture. This is... You know what was being described in the 1970s again very much a, a, a sense of you know, this is what criminals are like so you know there's a sort of summary in the really in the 60s and 70s becomes the a real idea about there's a there's something called a criminal personality out there that people who commit crimes show persistent cognitive errors and distortion make crimes more likely they seem to be more impulsive and not care about the consequences and there are other risk factors which would make those risk factors even more potent. So, for example, if you're a bit impulsive and you're prone to cognitive distortions, if you then drink a lot of alcohol, that's going to make those situations worse. And that's why we know that substance misuse is a powerful risk factor for almost any type of crime you can name, um, but especially violence, in fact. Social isolation, interestingly, is also a risk factor, particularly for violence, not so much crime generally. But you could see that social isolation might also be something that would make these other risk factors worse. But, and there's a big but about all these studies, and the first thing, that, the first but that we have to think about is that nearly all these studies rest on the study of detected and convicted offenders. It may well be that the criminal personality we've just described is the personality of the rather ineffective and useless criminal who always gets caught. And that the really, you know, that really effective and, and intelligent, thoughtful people who break the law don't get caught and don't get detected in these studies and certainly don't participate in them either. Certainly in my experience of trying to look at moral reasoning um, in people who were labelled as psychopaths, um, the people who I strongly suspected to be weapons-grade psychopaths were not remotely interested in participating in my study. Um, and in a way, you could work that out. If you're a profoundly antisocial person, helping somebody out by participating in this study is not high on their list of priorities. So, um, so we always had a thought, really, that you, if you study antisociality, the most antisocial people probably won't help you. So there's a real issue about... I mean, the, for a start, you know, there's a problem about self-reports of detected criminals. There's a bit of a bias in terms of young criminals because mo most criminal psychologists don't want to go to prisons and sit down with people who've committed horribly violent offences. They much prefer to go to prisons and talk to young people who've committed acts of theft, for example, repeated acts of theft or taking and driving away. So dealing, you know, talking to young people who've committed delinquent acts is, is somewhat easier. And actually, it's practically easier because, for example, to actually go into a high-security prison to talk to people who are very violent, is, prisons don't encourage it, um, and it, you know, it's, not, it's, not easy to, it's not easy to do. The big problem, though, is that crime, all crime, there's not such a thing as crime. All crime is not the same. Crimes include taking and driving away, burning down your neighbour's fence, not paying your taxes, killing your partner for the life insurance, and battering your child to death. All these behaviours are not the same, not remotely the same. And the idea that there would be one single psychological mindset that drives them is not tenable. And indeed it's not tenable, the evidence is, is against it. So, for example, if you look at domestic, at domestic homicide perpetrators, the vast majority of domestic homicide perpetrators are, are very unusual offenders. They're often older. They often don't have any history of, of, of criminal records or of violence in the past at all. They may have lots of evidence of pro-social behaviour, so they may have held down jobs, been married to the same person for a long time. They may be pillars of their community. So they just don't fit with the idea of a criminal personality at all. 
And yet, they say, that is the majority um, of, of domestic homicide perpetrators. And that's also, to some extent, true of people who, uh, who batter either their partners or their children. These are not necessarily people who are irritable, uh, sensation-seeking, etc., etc. So there are probably, there are similar but different processes going on for every type of crime, because you know, each type of crime represents a type of action which has meaning for the offender and which represents a set of choices. Now, the types of crime that you can, break, you can do impulsively without thinking are probably things like criminal damage, getting into drunken fights, nicking things on impulse, those sorts of things. And, and they are problematic and troublesome and tiresome and they cost us all a lot of money. But I would also like to suggest to you that they may, although they're very frequent, they may not be the crimes that really worry us most. I think the crimes that worry most of us are, the cri are crimes of violence. And it's a particular issue because, because it raises the question of what we should do about people who commit serious acts of violence. Because in a sense, people who steal things from us or break our property or defraud us there are things that we could do. We could get the money back from them. We can make them spend their time. We can get a type of recompense from them. Um, and there's ways that we could do that in quite pro-social ways that would be quite helpful. But in terms of violent offenders, um, it's a bit of a puzzle. We need to understand why they did what they did in order to understand what to do about them. And particularly, we want to know whether we're going to be safe in the future. And finally, the other big but is that it just doesn't make sense to see people as separate from their social influences. It just makes no sense at all. The idea that every individual is somehow a, a, separate, a separate sort of atom not connected to other people just doesn't fit with what we know about social psychology, doesn't fit with how we know about human beings live and work. We are profoundly social animals, and yes, we have an individual psychology that's very important to us, but actually just the fact that you can sit in this room and listen to me talking very quietly, obeying all the completely unwritten rules that nobody had to tell you, is a nice example of the social psychology that, you is, that is part of who you are right now. And you rely very heavily on that social psychology um, in terms of ordinary social life. So the idea of studying people as individuals separate from social psychology really doesn't make a lot of sense. So another way, perhaps, to look at the minds of people who break the criminal law is to talk to them. There's a, well, there's a novel idea. Um, but instead of measuring their skulls or getting them to fill out questionnaires, um, what you could do is you could sit down and talk to them. And that is indeed how a lot of criminology has been going in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, really looking at trying to understand what is going on for the people who decide to break the law. And one of the early studies, again from the 1970s, is, um, comes from um, uh, some criminologists called Sykes and Matzer. And again, the, one of the reasons that this, this whole discourse changes is because the criminologists from a sociological background come and get in on the act in terms of talking <coughs> to criminals. It isn't just psychologists coming in talking to people who've broken the law. The sociologists come in and start talking to them. And what Sykes and Matzer noticed is that the juvenile delinquents that they were talking to didn't seem to have this criminal personality. They didn't seem to be irritable and angry all the time. They didn't seem to be callous and irresponsible and uninterested in what other people thought of them. In fact, they expressed quite a lot of guilt. They expressed admiration of people who were law-abiding. But they did, they, and they had, they had moral views. They weren't moral idiots, as it were. They, weren't, they didn't have... They didn't have an absence of moral thinking. What they had was right, quite well-organised moral thinking. But you know, they had views about who was a legitimate victim and who was not a legitimate victim. Um, and they recognised uh, legal and moral norms. So Sykes and Matzer, what they noticed was that these young people had a series of linguistic devices that they would use to make themselves feel better about what they'd done. And Sykes and Matzer called these neutralization techniques. And so that one of the things you could say to yourself um, in relation to you committing a crime, you could say, it's not, it wasn't my fault. Or you could say, oh, well, then they're not really harmed by what I did. Uh, the people, I, I, I didn't really hurt them. Or they deserved it. They, de they deserved it. Um, 
you were just as bad in my day. So very people, juvenile delinquents, talking to the researchers, say, well, you know, all young people are like this. When you were young, you did exactly the same. I, I'm, you know, I'm no, I'm not, didn't do anything very different from anybody else. And then interestingly, in the context of juvenile delinquents, very much this idea of I was with a group of people, I had to stick with my friends. And of course, for teenagers, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's not something that you hear so much from adults who've broken the law. But that idea of neutralization techniques that you might say to yourself before you commit an offense, or to make yourself feel better after the offense, became quite influential in the psychology of crime because, it, again, it fitted in with the cognitive distortion models that had already been described by Jokelson and Samanoff. But it also suggested that there might be a whole, say, type of linguistic arguments that might be worth looking at how people talk how people talk themselves into action, um, which, which seemed to be quite interesting. Of course, the other thing that's interesting about this, um, um, if you just think about the last time that you did something that you're not terribly proud of now, um, if you just have a look through those lists, at least probably two or three of those things you used yourself in order to convince yourself that what you did wasn't, wasn't so bad. And, and, and what Sykes and Matz has suggested that actually, in terms of the sociology of rule-breaking, we all of us, how, we know we very rarely break the law just to say, oh, I'm, I'm bad, I'm going to do a bad thing and I don't care. What we tend to do is generate a narrative of how what we're going to do isn't really so bad. And that makes it easier to do. And that idea of neutralization techniques um, is, um, is import, has become important, I think, in the psychology of crime. Also what emerged in the 1970s was a counter-debate which said, oh, well, okay, well, what makes people keep the law then? In fact, the, since the vast majority of people keep the law, something like about between 60 and 70% of people at any one time are keeping the criminal law. And the vast majority of people will get through a life without ever breaking the criminal law at all. In fact, a, quite rec a recent study of some 20,000 people suggested that most crime is accounted for by a, a very small percentage of the population. There's a very small... 5% of the population who actually commit most of the crimes that we're worried about. That study is quite interesting because um, uh, it's a study by Vaughan et al. from 2011. And what it suggests is actually perhaps there is something to the idea that there's a group of people out there who are a bit riskier than the rest of us. And I might come back and say something about that if I've got time. But what Theodore Hirschi um, and his group suggested that perhaps the people who keep the law seem to have an ability to to exert self-control. And some of you will be familiar um, with uh, the, the marshmallow test and the idea of being able to exert some control over your wishes and desires. This is the marshmallow test was, a, a 19, again, a 1960s study of children um, that, in, that children were told, and they put, you put a child in a room with a marshmallow and said, if you don't eat the marshmallow, you can have two in 10 minutes' time. Um, and so the children were then divided into those who woofed down the marshmallow and those who managed to you know, hold on for 10 minutes. But what was interesting about that is that, uh, and it has been replicated several times since, is that people who have a degree of effortful control over their desires do seem to do better later in school um, and, in, and in work. Actually impulsively giving in to whatever you think or feel um, does often get people into trouble. So, and this is what Hirschi and Gottfriedson uh, found. Uh, in their, they, they suggested that the ability to control yourself really starts in childhood. And if you lose effortful control, you become impulsive, you prefer rather simple things, you, you have a physical, you, you, know, you think very physically, you don't think very psychologically, very self centered, a temper component. Again, very similar to the criminal personality. But any, a low self control plus criminal opportunity is what makes crime more likely said he or she. So uh, more in the 1980s, um, late 1970s, early 80s, Tony Parker, who was, I think, actually originally a journalist and then studied sociology, published some extraordinary um, um, narrative accounts of interviews with life sentence prisoners and sex offenders. I think they're all out of print now, crying to be brought back into print, actually. They are fantastic um, accounts. If you get a chance to read them, you can get them secondhand. Um, but they're, they're a tremendous read, but then they're literally just verbatim interviews 
with people um, who've committed serious offences. And this is really one of the, the first, the narrative turn in the psychology of offending, to, to study how offenders see themselves and how they talk about how their offences and whether, <clears throat> whether that can give us any clues about, about what puts people at risk. Um, so Professor Shad Maruna, um, now at Rutgers University, but happily returning to our shores to Manchester, is a sociologist of crime who has <coughs> spent <coughs> the last 20 years uh, studying, um, studying what makes offenders give up offending. Um, and he, in an early paper, he said, well, given that most young offenders give up offending, again, which rather undermines the idea of the criminal personality that makes you offend for the rest of your life, most offenders, the peak of offending is in your late teens, early 20s. And the vast majority of offend young offenders will give it up. Um, and by their late 20s, early 30s, they will have stopped offending. And only a minority persist. So what makes young offenders give up offending? And what Shad Maruna found in his Liverpool assistance study was that those people who could, could believe in a sense of agency, the people who managed to give up offending, they gave an account of themselves as people who could make choices, who could make a difference to themselves, who could see, who could look back on how they used to think and think, I don't think that way anymore. I can see now why I was thinking that way, but I see a very di a different way. I can see that I have changed. And they also were able to say what they had done to affect that change. So again, the sense of empowerment, a sense of not being, as it were, at the mercy of events. Whereas the people who persisted didn't really have a story of themselves as making choices. They talked about themselves as constantly being on the end of other people's choices, on the end of events. But there was, they were pretty helpless and passive um, in, in the context of their lives. I want now just to talk about violence um, a bit more because, um, as I say, most of the studies I've quoted so far have really been about about delinquents, and by delinquency I mean criminal damage, minor fights, taking and driving away, property, th you know, repeated thefts, shoplifting. That's what we would call delinquency. And so it's troubling, it's expensive, but it's not violence. And as I say, there's a peak in late teens, early 20s, or mid-teens to late teens. Really, quite a significant proportion of young people will commit some sort of criminal act. Some studies have suggested that as many as 80% of young people will commit some sort of criminal act in their late teens. But, of course, the vast majority uh, then stop offending altogether. All um, and only a minority continue to commit crimes. And, of course, only a minority of people who break the rules commit acts of violence. Twen of all the recorded crime that there is in England and Wales, only 20% of it is violence. <coughs> so even if that were an under-reporting, it would still be a minority. Of, of the type of, of the ways that people break the, break the law. And this is a quote from the Supreme Court from a few years ago. Violence is not a term of art. It is capable of bearing many meanings and applying to many different types of behaviour. And I think that's very wise and very helpful because, again, I think when we talk about violence, we're not just talking about one thing. We're talking about lots of very separate human types of action and choice. <coughs> just to remind you... Um, some of you who heard me speak last year will be familiar with the, the evidence that, that crime, the crime rates are dropping and have been dropping for um, uh, the last sort of 20 years or so. Um, and, that includes, uh, and that includes violence too. So we're really talking about... I want to talk now about the 20% of offenders who commit acts of violence. What are the commonest kinds of violence? Well, the commonest kind of violence is assaults by young men on other young men both of whom are drunk. Um, and there are about a million of those every year in England and Wales. Those are just the, the ones we know about then. I mean, there may well be another million that aren't reported to anybody, but the ones that we know about that are recorded by the police, about a million um, uh, assaults by young men on other young men. And, of course, they can be very troublesome. I mean, they, they can result in death and serious injuries, so they are a serious issue. Very close behind, just under a million, and some years it it's over a million, is assaults usually by men on, on domestic partners. I put men on partners, but actually, of course, we know that 
I mean, men account for about 80% of domestic violence perpetrators. There are an interesting subgroup of domestic violence perpetrators who are female. And then the next commonness is physical abuse of children. Um, and bearing in mind that physical abuse and neglect of children gave rise to about 40,000 children being taken into care um, in 2014. So that's quite, a, that's, a, that's quite a lot of violence going on in the home. And again, that's just, what, that's just the stuff we know about. Uh, we have no idea how much is going on. What's noteworthy about this is, again, it's interpersonal. It involves an interaction between people. And it, most violence takes place in the context of relationships. Stranger violence is different from relational violence. And that's a key variable that I think is it, that the psychology of violence has to engage with. Again, this is just a, a reminder about the homicide uh, victims. Uh, the, the rates of homicide have been dropping uh, pretty steadily over the last 20 years. Uh, anybody who's interested in that blue peak in 2002-2003, that is an artefact um, by Dr. Shipman um, and, uh, and is an artefact resulting from the Smith Inquiry, which, which claimed that Dr. Shipman killed over 200 people, which, say, jiggled the statistics a bit that year. Um, so what are the risk factors for, for violence? Um, and being young and male, well, that's obviously not a psychological issue um, beyond the fact that it has a certain psychological aspect to it. Cultural norms about the use of violence is often obviously important. Social isolation, paranoid mental states, substance misuse. Of course, substance misuse can give rise to the paranoid mental states, alcohol and cocaine, par excellence, uh, giving rise to paranoid mental states. Anything that disturbs your reality testing, uh, makes it more likely that you'll, certainly that you'll probably break the criminal law. It's part of that impulsiv um, impulsivity we talked about earlier. But actually, if you have a seriously distorted view of reality, then you may well, for example, act in self-defense. You may think you're acting in self-defense, whereas in fact, you've actually, you know, you're not being attacked at all. And that's the combination of a paranoid mental state and substance misuse could make somebody very risky indeed in terms of feeling that they were in danger. Hypervigilance from unresolved childhood trauma um, and I was just looking today at the, the hu really huge amount of data about how adverse childhood experiences are, um, if you have lots of adverse childhood experiences, is a potent predictor of later violence. Insecure attachment and relational disturbance. I put question marks behind this really because this is an aspect of the psychology which is a bit less well studied. But certainly, again, we have, we have some evidence um, that insecure, again, from from childhood adversity, um, because insecure attachment is a proxy term, really, which means that you can't regulate your, your negative emotions well, and also means you respond to threat very easily. But the other thing about relational disturbance is that the breakup of relationships causes enormous distress and anger. And if you are not able to regulate your negative feelings well, then, and you add in some of these other risk factors, you may be somebody who is at high risk for criminal violence. So the psychology of your particular violence really needs to look at all these particular risk factors as well as what has meaning for you, the individual. So one aspect of this, the psychology of violence, is what we call an absence of mentalizing. So mentalizing is the process by which you and I are constantly reading other people's faces and, and, and bodies, body language for signals of what they're thinking and feeling. It's the means by which we assume that other people are intentional beings like ourselves. We're sitting here having thoughts and intentions. What am I going to do with this vector leaves? Which way am I going to do? And all that sort of stuff. You know, you, but we're, you, you, so you're perceiving and appraising your own intentions, but of course you're doing that for other people. And that process is called mentalizing, about keeping mind in mind. And what we know is, or what seems to be emerging from um, some small-scale studies, but they're going to be bigger, there's a big national trial ongoing, is that people who commit antisocial acts have deficits in this mentalizing process. So this is really a 21st century version of those cognitive thinking distortions that Jokerson and Samanoff and the Isings described in the 70s. But it's a bit more fine-grained, it's a bit more nuanced. So this is, and this is what the people who are actually doing the antisocial acts describe. That, so that what they, they will say, well, what I think is the only thing that's real and what you think doesn't matter. 
what I think is real, and it's the only reality that matters. And only the physical is real. If you, if you fall over or if you hit me by accident, for example, if an antisocial person, if you were to, to hit them by accident in a crowded corridor, you know, they might assume that you, know, that you had hurt them deliberately because you know, you've given them a physical jolt and they'd felt a bit uncomfortable and they might assume that you've done that deliberately. But only the physical is real. The idea that there might be other ways to explore those the, uh, actions doesn't really happen. And intellectualization, just really not thinking, uh, not thinking in a subtle or, or a deep way about people's motives and feelings and choices. So these are, these are just some examples of how of people don't mentalize. So when you're th again, when you're thinking about the psychology of violence, we, I think it's important to think about who the victim is. Um, Again, say a man who is who beats his partner on a regular basis, his psychology is different from the psychology of a 22-year-old who's constantly stealing cars. These are not these are not equivalent states of mind. What sort of violence? Again, domestic violence is often very different from general getting into fight, drunken fights on a Saturday night type of violence. Again, if I take an example from battering from inter intimate partner violence. Battering partners typically are not violent in any other sphere. So when we're looking at violence, we talk about what affectful violence or affectless, how much emotion is in the room, whether it's impulsive or controlled, whether it's clear or confused, whether the, whether the person who's being violent seems excited or detached, and whether the violence is proactive, they're violent in order to achieve something, so for example, mugging you to get your bag, or whether it's reactive, suddenly you know, expressing violence because they're reacting to a perceived threat. And what they have in common often is disturbance of reality, real problems in threat perception, so very low threshold for threat perception. Other people don't seem real or human. It's a disturbance of that profoundly social connection, something that, that again, that, um, that Cleckley was talking about all those years ago. Nothing will matter later because this isn't real, and very much an absence of consequential reasoning. I was in a therapy group with some fire setters last week, and uh, one of the guys said, you know, I just didn't think about the consequences. And the, somebody else said, yes, I didn't think about the consequences at all. And I said, gosh, well, that's, uh, that sounds a bit risky, taking action without thinking about the consequences at all. And they both looked very startled and said, you know, you're right. You're right, I hadn't thought of it like that before, that it might be risky to act without thinking of the consequences. But you know, that's pretty, you know, that, that, I think, is not, really not unusual. And then, you know, not in my fire service particularly, but the wish to hurt. That's, that's scary when you see it. Denigration of vulnerability. Thankfully, not very common in violent perpetrators, but, but definitely there in a few. They're the people we really need to worry about. They're the people we need to identify early. They're the people that we need to, to get on a short leash and manage. Um, an early study from us, by one of the few studies of convicted rapists. This is a, these are salutary to read, and Diana Scully's book called *Riding the Bullet Gillies* is a very painful read, which is a study of convicted rapists from the 1980s. Uh, these are men who are very reluctant to accept that they've been violent in any way. Um, they blamed, they almost inevitably blamed the women that they'd raped. Um, they saw it as very minor. Many of the men she interviewed were very surprised to be convicted. Um, um, alcohol and drugs were to blame and they, they said, I'm, I'm a nice guy really I don't really understand how this has happened now, and I, I don't think there's any reason to think that convicted rapists are very different and in, uh, rape is a very particular type of violence and really because it's about denigrating somebody else uh, it's not about sex it's about making somebody feel horrible um, it is literally, if you'll excuse the expression saying fuck you to somebody um, and, and so the, uh, convicted rapists are very difficult to treat uh, or to get to change their minds because most convicted rapists don't think they've done anything wrong. So typically, those in a violent state of mind see other people as threat or prey. They feel justified in what they do. They overcome inhibitions to violence. It's a communication, often, to the victim. It's a very powerful communication. And on that note, I think I'm going to stop. This is just a reminder of, the, um, of Paul McLean's model of the mind. And people sometimes say that violence comes out of the reptilian brain, 
But actually, I think, there's, I think that's a misnomer. Your reptilian brain is really the thing that keeps you breathing and awake <laughs> and hungry. <laughs> but your mammalian brain, and especially your neocortex, seem to be the parts of your brain that are most activated when people are violent. And it's those areas of the brain that we need to understand more and better, and there are many studies of that. But fundamentally, I think, we can't do better than really listening to the voices of people who've committed acts of violence and trying to use what they tell us to help us make plans to understand the violent mind better and to make plans to, to try and change it. So I'm going to stop there and see if we, we have time for a few questions.